Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. This very important talk. We're very lucky today to have Dr. Newton Osborne, my friend and fellow alumni, Go Blue University of Michigan. <laughs> Alumnus, I think is correct, not alumni. What I'm going to speak about today is about the progress we have made in the reduction of maternal mortality from the beginning of the last century to now and see how we compare with that in Panama. We'll present some of the work of the research work we did at Hospital Materno in Japantil, Jose Domingo de Waldia. Uh, this specific work we did actually in 2014, studying maternal mortality. We started because when I started here, I mentioned a, a moment ago, I came to retire. But the Minister of Health at the time, Alaine, Camilo Alaine, who was my classmate when we were undergraduates, asked, well, if I could help a bit with the residency program here in Chiriqui, they were not doing very well, since he knew I had been director of residency training at the University of, uh, State University of New York in Syracuse. Uh, and so I said, yes. The next thing he said, well, won't you be the director? I, stood, I had to write the program for them, and eventually, and within a year, we got full accreditation for the U.S. And finally, when they asked if I could be director of the hospital, I said, enough, no more, no more. I retired last <laughs> January 2020. About a, a this time, when, when a woman becomes pregnant, most of her relatives, uh, husband and whatnot, see a happy person with a nice little baby, and everything went fine, the pregnancy was fine, the delivery went well, no complications postpartum, and we have a healthy baby with no problems. That's what we envision. Unfortunately, this is not the case still to a considerable number of uh, women, as we will see further ahead. At the turn of the 20th century, 10% or more births were associated with maternal death. In some hospitals, it was up to 30%. One out of uh, every three women that deliver died of childbed fever, or what they call streptococcal infection, that uh, was uh, all the way to the one-third of the 20th century. That was still a big problem. At the end, of onset of World War II, 6.1 per thousand life births in the United States were associated with maternal mortality, which is still quite elevated by today's standards. By 1990, about 10 per 100,000 live births, this is when I was in the United States now, were associated with maternal mortality in the USA, uh, one of the developed countries. And the US still among developed countries has one of the highest maternal mortalities, uh, and we try, we'll try to see why. By year 2000, we were able to expect maternal deaths in single and double digits, double digits by 100,000, rather than in percentages, like when the uh, century started. To who we owe this? The, the biggest deaths were infection and hemorrhage back then. A Hippocrates, in the year 400 before the common era, was the first to recognize and observe and record case of purpural sepsis. If you ever go to the island of Kos, a, in the southwestern part of Turkey, a, you, you still have his writings. They have a library of his books there. Charles White, in 1773, in the U.S., was the source to recognize it was infection. Oliver Wendell Holmes, in 1843, was the first to recognize it was contagious. So the pestilence carrier to the delivery room will have to look to God for forgiveness, or man will never forgive him. Uh, they used to come from the autopsy room when they told him that the woman was ready without washing the hand, delivered, and that's what got the women infected. Ignaz Philip Semmelweis, that was in the University of Vienna, was the first to recognize that washing your hand with chloride as lime, uh, you will uh, you reduce maternal mortality that way. Well, the people at the University of Vienna said, oh, this guy is telling us that something we don't see on our hand is the one responsible for killing this woman. They threw him out of the university for <laughs> saying that. They actually uh, fired him. And he was, uh, so he started the university, he was a Hungarian. 
and he started in his own hospital in uh, uh, Budapest, which I visited a few years back. Uh, Alexander Fleming was the one who, in 1929, finally discovered penicillin, and maternal death from sepsis went way down. What about hemorrhage? Anesthesia, because of course they would do cesarean section on women without anesthesia, and that was almost uniformly a maternal death. They took probably to save the baby if it was too big or whatever. John Snow started with chloroform, and James Young Simpson with ether. And I will tell you when I fractured my arm, I will tell you how old I am. They put me to sleep with ether <laughs> in my, my conception <laughs> back then. Uh, and Carl Landsteiner discovered blood types. You could, could now do transfusion. And in the 1940 in NIH, the Rh factors were discovered, so safer transfusion were possible from, uh, by blood technologists by 1950. I was a blood technologist at the University of Michigan, so I know very well uh, how to test for all these different things uh, uh, to make safe transfusions. Maternal mortality, are we, st are we still making progress? As a matter of fact, you'll find out that in some parts of the world it's getting worse, the maternal mortality, rather than improving. First of all, we must get together with our definitions. Practically every country has their own definition for what is maternal mortality. We will be using uh, the World Health Organization definition for the data we will present in, uh, further on, uh, except the one from Boquete where we did the study. Maternal mortality by the World Health Organization is that of a woman who is pregnant or who died within 42 days of the six weeks of the end of her pregnancy, regardless of duration of pregnancy, even if it was an ectopic pregnancy, location of pregnancy, or cause related to pregnancy, or aggravated by pregnancy, or related to management of pregnancy, but not by accidental or incidental causes. That's WHO definition. If you go to the CDC definition, that of a woman during pregnancy or within one year of the end of pregnancy. So you see how their numbers are going to be larger than the ones of the WHO. From a pregnancy complication, from a chain of events initiated by pregnancy, or from the aggravation of an unrelated condition by the physiologic effects of pregnancy. That's CDC. What's the definition in Panama? Again, different. Maternal death, Panama's definition, death of a woman in which investigation determines that pregnancy, delivery, obstetric complication, or man management complication was the direct or indirect cause of death if that occurs within one year of the obstetric event. So you can see if you go worldwide to establish what is maternal mortality is going to be different in every country because each one of their own definition. But now uh, the definitions that are reported internationally are used, usually the one that is used by the WHO. So actually, if anything, it will be worse than what is reported because they only follow the woman for six weeks postpartum while we follow it for one year and so that uh, the CDC Millennium Development Goal, that was in a meeting in 1990, they were uh, proposing a 75% reduction in global maternal mortality between 1990 and 2015. How are we doing? In 1990, there were 550,000 maternal deaths reported worldwide. By 2008, 350,000. That means that we only have a 36.6% reduction, far short of what we planned to, uh, in 1990. And in uh, 2014, there was a publication in The Lancet about global causes of maternal death. They followed maternal mortality from January 1st, 1993, right, uh, uh, 2003, to December 31st uh, of uh, uh, 2013, over a 10-year period. What did they find? During that period, those 10 years, there were 2,443,000 maternal deaths. If we look, an average of 243,000 
300 per year up to 212, we will have achieved 55.6% in maternal deaths up to now. So even b by then, we were short of the 75,000 that was intended to achieve in 1990. Problem, the reduction in maternal mortality is not uh, even a uniform across the globe, and it's not even or uniform even within countries. If you look at certain groups within countries, the mortality differs. 287,000 women die each year in developing countries because of pregnancy complications. And this is only in developing countries. We are not a, 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 a developed countries. Differences within countries, higher rates of that are found among women more economically disadvantaged. This is the case in the United States, and we'll see further ahead is the case in Panama also. Black women are three to four times as likely as white women to die during pregnancy or childbirth. And I notice that difference because I work at Creighton University and at the State University of New York for several years, especially at Creighton University. If you saw a case of preeclampsia or you saw maternal death, I think it's one, two a year, if at all, a totally different. Went to Howard University, and it's more like Panama than here. You saw preeclampsia, well, I got a lot of them also you saw from intravenous drug use, uh, came high on cocaine and uh, heroin and uh, completely drunk at times to the living room, which you didn't see, for example, in Omaha. And as a result, maternal mortality in that group was a, a more elevated. Sub-Saharan Africa has the greatest burden of maternal mortality, yet here too the story is not uniform. Maternal mortality rates have in fact increased in some countries. I was in Sierra Leone for a while, and we would deliver babies in huts with dirt floor, only glass. I didn't even have a mask to deliver those babies. And uh, for me, curious enough, they did very well. I think not one of the women I delivered in a hut had maternal sepsis. Then they had a little internal war there where they were cutting off the arm of babies. I don't know if you remember that. The tribe, the Mendes and the Mandingas would not get along. And maternal mortality immediately surged uh, because of that. Most countries in the re region are small but promising decreases in maternal mortality. Countries with substantial increases tend to fall in two categories, and one of them will be in both categories. First of all, countries whose health system have been decimated by war or internal conflict. This is the case in the Congo, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, Somalia, Zimbabwe, Sudan, for example, or countries with extremely high rates of infection with HIV. As you will see, that will be South Africa, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, Kenya, Zimbabwe again, has it in both, and Zambia. Uh, and those countries actually, maternal mortality has been increasing because of these conditions. Worldwide study done January 1st to 2003 is the same a, a study I mentioned before. Most common causes of maternal death worldwide, oddly enough, Panama still has exactly the same cases, different than other developed countries, like you'll notice ahead. The direct obstetrics, they divided 1,771,000 was the, the uh, reason for that in 73% of those who died. And in direct obstetrics, 672,000, or 27%. What does direct obstetrics and indirect obstetric mean? Direct obstetric, for example, hemorrhage. The most common cause for that to this day, it still is. Hypertensive disorder, 14%. Sepsis, 10.7%. Oddly enough, Panama still has those three as the first reasons for that, as we will see in the work we did at Hospital de Waldia. Abortion, 7.9%, especially in places where it's illegal and they use a methods that a, a expose them to death. I remember when it was illegal in the United States. We were kept awake every single night for infectious complications, perforations of the uterus, a, a hemorrhage, a, a septic shock a, because of a, this problem. Thromboembolic disorders and other direct causes. 
Hemorrhage, hypertensive disorder, sepsis are still responsible for more than half of maternal deaths worldwide. And they are still responsible for the majority of deaths in Panama right now, as we will see from the numbers that we studied when we, uh, I, I conducted this work with some of the residents at Hospital de Valdia. Pregnancy related death, most common causes in the US, postpartum hemorrhage, hypertensive disorder, and now not sepsis, is venous thromboembolism. You practically won't have much death from sepsis in the US, especially those that we see in clinics, because we screen them. We screen them for HIV, we screen them for syphilis, we screen them for a, 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 a gonorrhea, chlamydia, mycoplasmas, and so forth. They don't do that here. They only screen for HIV and for a, 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 a syphilis here in Panama and ignore all the others. And I try to tell them because a week didn't go by when I was uh, working with the residents of Ovaldia that we didn't see one or two ectopic pregnancies. That's over 100 a year. And they said they didn't do it because it was too expensive to do the culture. So I usually ask them, well, how much does an ectopic pregnancy cost you? How much, how about 100, 110 of them a year? Let's say, how much does a maternal debt from sub six cost you? It's a lot more expensive for praying for the screening, but that's the way that they, whoever is, a, is a, a making the budget is not the same person seeing the patients. That's the problem. Most common causes in Panama, if you notice, is still exactly the same as they were in the time of Hippocrates. Obstetric hemorrhage, hypertensive disorder of of pregnancy, yeah, I see so much of the, a, like in all my life we saw one or two cases of preeclampsia a month was a lot. Here we see 10 a day. We have a ward full, 36 patients, usually 20 of those are preeclamptic. And when, of course, once they develop eclampsia, we have to deliver them no matter how far advanced the pregnancy is. A publication came out just April of this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, postpartum hemorrhage, the leading and preventable, the same thing we notice when we look at our chart, that most of the cases who, that, who died from hemorrhage were preventable. Cause of maternal illness and, uh, illness and death globally is still postpartum hemorrhage. No? Why is postpartum hemorrhage? It can cause severe anemia, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, that's the killer, Many times you can only stop the bleeding, all you do is a cesarean hysterectomy, which is a, a, a most dangerous time to do a hysterectomy. All the vessels are big, easy. You have to be very careful how you tie your knots. If you put it too tight, you go right through the vessel. Uh, so, uh, uh, very dangerous. Multi-system organ failure, the pituitary, the kidneys, uh, the heart start going and eventually death. That's the danger of a postpartum hemorrhage. Worldwide, one woman dies from postpartum hemorrhage every seven minutes. This means in the time I'm speaking to you here, seven to nine women will have died of postpartum hemorrhage somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Maternal death worldwide in developed regions from hemorrhage is about 18%, and we'll see how that relates to the United States ahead. And in developing regions, 82%. So the burden of death is primarily in underdeveloped countries or what we call developing countries. I remember when I was in Sierra Leone and seeing how things work there, I said, well, these are not developing countries. Our countries never to be developed the way they're run uh, until uh, somehow they get better administration. With 11% of world death by postpartum hemorrhage, the U.S. has the highest rate of postpartum hemorrhage mortality among the developed countries. Eh? And that is by the differences, like I mentioned before, in Omaha, in Michigan, unless you go to Detroit, eh, in upstate New York, it's totally different than if you are in Washington, D.C., if you are in Detroit, Michigan, if you're in Baltimore, Michigan. Those look more like underdeveloped countries than what you will see in obstetric in developed countries. Postpartum hemorrhage are two types. The primary postpartum hemorrhage occurs within for the first 24 hours following a delivery. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage occurs 24 hours to 12 weeks after delivery. And what are, how is the postpartum blood loss Control naturally. First of all, the uterus gets contracts, 
and closes all the vessels that were communicating with the placenta following delivery. And secondary, by the activation of the coagulation cascade, if all of those worked well and you don't have any laceration, most women, the overwhelming uh, majority, will leave the hospital without having a, an excessive blood loss. What are the causes then of postpartum hemorrhage? That's what I used to teach her, isn't it? We call it the four T's. Tone, eh? a trauma, eh? we'll, we'll go through them. Tone, or uterine contractions. Trauma, uterine and perineal lacerations, and it would surprise how many times these lacerations are missed if you don't have a careful examination of the woman following a delivery. I tell them, a, 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 and that's what I usually, when I used to a, teach my students and residents, I tell them, and the lawyers are much better teachers than I am. You want to avoid them. So follow the examination. You have to follow a, before leaving. No hurry to pull down on the placenta, uh, all, all of those things. Tissue, retain fragments of placenta is the other one. And the last one is thrombin, clotting factor deficiency, some defect. This is actually quite rare. Less than 1% of the cases of postpartum hemorrhage are due to a coagulation problem. No? Uterine atony is responsible for 70% of the cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Second one are lacerations. No? And lacerations can happen, for example, if you have a face presentation, the leaching of the baby is against the a bottom wall of the vagina, you can have a laceration back there, and when it comes out, it looks like it's completely normal. So unless you do a complete examination, observe the vagina, vagina completely at length, do a rectal examination, if you see your finger coming up through the vagina, you had a problem there. You can repair it right then and there, but if you, they send the patients home and she comes back with bleeding one, two weeks later, now you have to do a colostomy, uh, to, to do the repair, yeah, you, you have to break down the whole thing, spend an hour or two in the uh, operating room fixing this repair, having her come back in three to four months to do the reanastomosis again, and by then I assure you she has seen a lawyer. No? So, it's very important to do this examination uh, before they leave. Lifetime risk of pregnancy related death in the United States one in 2,100, then at the time when a, a, a up, up to when I was there, it was still that. Republic of Panama, one in every 1,428 live births. The Chiriqui province, one in 763. It's seen, but that is actually an artificial number. A, the reason for that is that Hospital de Ovaldia is the only hospital with a neonatal ICU and with a pregnancy or a obstetrics intensive care unit. So we get all patients that are complicated from Boca del Toro, from the Comarca, from Western Veraguas, many of them, from uh, Costa Rica, they come to our hospital to deliver and all the little towns around. So, if you look only at the patients that are from Chiriqui, didn't come, uh, but, and if they die, the other thing, in the Hospital de Ovaldia, they count as Chiriqui deaths, not as Boca's death or the Comarca deaths. That's where you see this number here. So, when we looked at the, ch the charts of patients that were from Chiriqui, only 40% of those who died were from this province. 35% had come from the Comarca. Uh, and from Bocas del Toro, 25%. If you remove that 60%, Chiriqui is very similar to the rest of Panama. Uh, uh, that's uh, where it comes. And a classification of that by type of that, direct obstetrics, 42.5%, indirect obstetrics, 57.5%. What did we actually find? If you notice, hypertensive disorder in 12.5% percent of those women who died at Hospital de Maldia, obstetric hemorrhage in 10 percent of them, septic shock, which we, say we rarely saw when I was in the United States, we see quite frequently here, and they come at times with irreversible septic shock. Yeah, you, there is no way you can save them. The arterioles are not contracting anymore. No? Thromboembolic disorder, 10.5 percent, and other causes, 60 percent. What did we have? Pulmonary sepsis, 
organophosphoric intoxication. What does this mean? So this, uh, they usually come from the Comarca and they had some problem, either nausea or fever or whatever, and the curandero in the Comarca gave them a, a tea made, I don't know of what, with the, 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 the patients didn't know many times, and they came practically comatose, and in some of them you just couldn't get them out, they, they would die, and you, uh, most of them you were able to save. Acute hepatic insufficiency, a good percentage of these patients have hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis A, A we see them. Massive hemothorax, miliary tuberculosis, we saw them. Interesting when you look in. I've only seen this in pathology books when I was in medical school, but here you see it in the, in the patients. Mitral stenosis, congestive heart failure, hemoglobinopathy, choriocarcinoma, they had a molar pregnancy. And what we usually do under those conditions is put them and birth control pills so they don't get pregnant in that in the first year. Since the way you're going to detect that that mole has become carcinomatous is the pregnancy test time going up without their being pregnant, let's say. But if they are pregnant on top of that, then you can't tell. And if you find out, then it's up to them if you can interrupt the pregnancy or not to save the mother's life. Other malignancies, cervical cancer you'll see, for example, they had an abnormal pap smear, uh, and the biops indicate that probably they had a, 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 a invasive cancer. You tell them, come back for a cone biopsy, and a, make sure you're using a, a, a condom if you're going to have intake course. They show up three months later pregnant. And of course, the treatment for this is going to be either radiation or what I, what I say, whatever oncologists use to treat, treat patients. They either cut it, they, 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 they burn it, or they poison it. It's going to be either surgery, chemotherapy, a, 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 or radiation, of course. And, and that will end the pregnancy. But then they choose to continue with the pregnancy, and by then, they have metastatic carcinoma, and they die from that. Fortunately, we don't, don't see it too frequently, but definitely we see it. Now, what kind of care, prenatal care, these women had received? Some of them, of course, they show to the emergency room and have no data. They are almost comatose, they can't tell you. Th so you don't know if they have prenatal care or not. That happened in 12.5% of those who died. Some of them would come with their chart from the Komodo Marca and let's say, yes, 15% uh, of them had no prenatal care whatsoever, that you know. Less than five minutes of visits to the doctor during their pregnancy in 47.5, and five or more vi visits in only 25% of those patients who died. We are talking here at the Hospital Jose Domingo de Ovaldia. That's part of the work we did. By location of where that occurred, 84% of these patients died in the hospital. And uh, so we started, which will go further ahead, a program to see if we could reduce if they arrive alive to the hospital, most of them should survive, even if they come in a coma. They, but they, and most of them do, but I think we could do better than that. And out of the hospital, 16%, they put them in the ambulance in La Comarca, in San Felix, in Cerro Punta, whatever. By the time they get to the hospital, the patient is dead, let's say. So 32.5% of those that we saw died pregnant. 30% died following a cesarean section. 32.5% died following a vaginal delivery. And 5.0% died of ectopic pregnancy. This should not happen today. That was possible, for example, when I was a student or even a resident. But now with ultrasound, and able to detect quantitatively beta HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, if that is present and you do an ultrasound and you see an empty uterus, that pregnancy is somewhere not in the uterus. Yeah? And even if you see it on one side, when you enter, make sure you examine the other a fallopian tube. I remember when I was a resident in San Francisco, we had a wound, we diagnosed the ectopic pregnancy, we had a long needle that we put in the posterior cul-de-sac, if we drew blood, we said, well, this is a rupture ectopic we went in. So, the, the chief resident on his side, well, here's the ectopic pregnancy. I said, no, it's over on my side. She had two, one on each tube. 
and I've seen them with an, a pregnancy in the uterus and ectopic pregnancy on the other side. With uh, what we can do with ultrasound today, so you shouldn't have any of those patients die if they arrive alive to the hospital uh, when you first see them. They should not die on you. This is what you get. You see the uh, fetus there. In, in a rupture tube. And if you don't diagnose it, and it used to be many times in the United States, they would come. I remember when we were in Detroit. Oh, no, she has an ectopic pregnancy. Eh? Because it was so common, for example, especially, especially in young ladies from Detroit, send them home. The next time she came to the hospital was to the morgue. She bled to death. Eh? So that shouldn't happen. Now, of those maternal deaths, when we re review by labor and delivery attendant, 52.5% of these women who died were attended by a physician, no? either in a, a, a San Felix or by the time they got to a, Ovaldia. 10% had were attended by a relative of na a neighbor, some place or by uh, in the comarca or so forth, and 37.5% did not deliver. They, they died pregnant, for example. Type of care, 70%, it means did not have a cesarean section, were attended by vaginal delivery, and surgical, 17.5%, they did a cesarean section on and still died, or dead on arrival by the time they got to the emergency room at the Waldia Hospital. When we review the chart and look critically through it, 92.5% of those deaths were preventable. Uh, when we look at the chart, huh? not preventable, 7.5%. She threw a saddle embolus to the lung. Not much you can do about that. Or am amniotic fluid embolus. Uh, not much you can do about that. Or she had a heart attack that she couldn't revive, for example. But 92.5% of them were preventable in the charts that we reviewed. So if it was preventable, why did it occur? because of delay in seeking or providing medical care. We look in the chart when the patient first complained, when was she first attended, when, she, when did she arrive to the emergency room, all of, and in practically all of them was some delay in attending to a patient either in the emergency room it itself or somebody recognizing what was happening at home and by the time they recognized it, it's because uh, she passed out, for example, she uh, became unconscious, then, oh, call the ambulance. By then, too late, no? The first delay, then, is remaining home too long, 80% of these patients. Second delay, the trip to the emergency room, coming from San Felix, from San uh, Veraguas, hour, hour and a half, two hours from Cerro Punta to get to the emergency room at the Valdia. The third delay was eight in the ER. She got to the ER and she sat there and somebody didn't recognize this as an emergency patient. Continue seeing something else instead of attending her first thing as soon as she got there. So, but there is more to the history, more than a maternal death alone. A, what I would say is maternal death is only the tip of the iceberg what happened to all those women who these events occurred to and survived, let's say? First of all, for every woman who dies from a pregnancy-related cause, about 20 more experience injury, infection, disease, disability, hysterectomy, so forth. Mm -hmm. This amounts to about 7 million women yearly. No? It also affects childhood death. What happened to the children that survived of a woman who died during delivery? A high percentage of infants who die before the age of one die because of deficiencies in the care of pregnant women during prenatal care and or during delivery. No? Trends in maternity mortality, key common factors is the access to good obstetrical care. How many of these women were we saw before, the 15, around 20% who come to the Comarca close to term who have not had one single prenatal visit to a physician or to a professional? Huh? That uh, could be avoided. How can we reduce maternal mortality? By improving care in two areas. One of them in the hospital, the other one 
in the prenatal clinic. Those two, improving it somehow. Hospital management of obstetric emergency and access to prenatal ambulatory care. Of course, we have worked on the top one, hospital manager of obstetric emergency. I will show some of the steps we have taken up over the year when I uh, was the director of uh, resident education and, and training. And access to prenatal ambulatory care is what the crop rotario de Boquete is one of them working on that. We'll just briefly mention it. How can we reverse the trend? Hospitals can expand their focus on preventable causes of obstetric complications and related deaths, implement multidisciplinary staff meetings to assess and review each obstetrical patient's risk factors. We, would, we started with every thir Thursday of the month, all physicians, nurses, and anybody who was in charge of attending the patients in any way had to attend to, one of, uh, to, to, to the conference uh, to assess uh, different patients uh, or what has happened in the month before. Staff can simulate obstetrical emergencies in the labor and delivery area. We started it with every new resident group or every new student group that came in a, a, at least every third month or every, by at least every six months, we simulated an emergency, what is going to happen without telling anybody, a, we're simulating it now. And it pretty much told us where the weak points were doing this. And have hospital use the maternal health compact, what does this mean? Speak with all those people who send patients to your hospital. We started doing that also. Don't have the patients just show up to the emergency room. Speak to the people in San Felix. Call, Mrs. So-and-so is coming. She's so much. We have seen her so many times. Her blood type is so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, this complication. So you are waiting for her there. You call the emergency room and tell me, as soon as that patient comes, call me, let's say. Yeah, and do that with all the people who refer patients to you, especially those that have uh, been associated with maternal death. Create bundles of best practices for improving practices in maternity care. A bundle should include the readiness, a should include the record that you recognize that you have a problem. I am amazed many times, how many times they went and rounds and this woman said, well, I'm having a severe headache a, and I feel some pain in my leg. A, okay, I will write the nurse so that she come and see you and take and I'll send you downstairs, whatever. You go back six hours later and it, it wasn't done. <laughs> so you call the nurse, you know, a response and then reporting protocols. Uh, we go over every single patient, at least when I used to go and round. Once in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, first time, you have seen every single patient that on that floor, especially the high-risk pregnant floor where I used to work. Uh, afternoon, you do that again. If there is a complication, you report it and you present it at the committee uh, for maternal mortality or maternal complications, which take place every month. Customized protocols should be posted, reviewed regularly, made available to all clinicians, no excuse for not knowing it. Let's say, implement multidisciplinary staff meetings, like I mentioned before, briefing with surgeons, nurses, scrub technicians, pediatricians, anesthetists for patients undergoing elective emergency, to identify shared understanding of the patient and the procedure, safety concerned about this particular patient, what additional resources might be needed in the event of an unexpected complication, communicate concerns to the patient and the family members that she authorizes to be, because many times somebody showed up, uh, how is Mrs. Martinez doing? Well, uh, how are you related to her? Does she authorize? Let's say, if she has not signed a paper that you can speak to the husband or you can speak to whoever, you really cannot discuss this patient with, with the relative, if, for example. Share decision making by the patient and the obstetrical team. We started those. So, simulate obstetrical emergencies. They elucidate for staff members critical timings and logistics involved in emergency. Many times for this problem, patients die. How long it takes to get products from the block bank? Uh, an hour is too long. We need to have it in 20 minutes, let's say. Where to find the hemorrhage card? People looking for it, they don't know where it was stored. Where to find infrequently used medications? All of those things you could have at the tip of your fingers. What is in a crash card? 
and how to use it when it's there. The patient has a cardiac arrest. The crash cart is there. Now what do you do? <laughs> you know, they have a... All of those things should be known. Has staff reviewed the emergency protocol recently? Make sure that every two, three months, all of them go over the protocol that it took one weekend at night to write up, for example. Develop and use maternal health compact, formalize relationship with lower resource hospital, Puerto Armuelle, La Concepcion, all of those, and clinics that transfer pregnant women when they require higher levels of maternal care. We are the only ones with an obstetrics ICU and with a neonatal ICU. So it used to, all of a sudden, this patient showed up to the emergency room. He said, don't make it that way. Have them call you, have them notify you she's coming, and why? In the event of an unexpected obstetric emergency whose care demands exceed their resources, they, they have somebody they can call, supportive clinicians in challenging situations. All of you have a sudden, they call you, well, Mrs. So-and-so broke her membranes, the, uh, the cord is out, I can feel pulsation. What do I do now? Put your hand and put her in the emergency room, in the uh, 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 car, emergency car, and send her immediately to Ovalde. And we have had some of those, and luckily enough, the baby has survived and the mother, no? This is what we do in the hospital. What are we to do in ambulatory care? Regular through, tour through La Comarca was one of the conditions that we discussed when we were in Rotary and decided it was too dangerous, too much work, and too much risk involved. So we used Dr. Miriam Rittmeyer's project training Gome Bugle midwives. It's something they tried in Guatemala quite successfully. We watched some movies of the first one in Haiti, where a pickup truck went around with a weight, of course, a, something to take blood pressure, deep six to test if there were proteinuria, if there were hematuria, if there were glucose in the urine, and, and they did a good, a good work with that. But we thought that this first one was just a bit too much for us in a Rotary. So, and the idea, of course, was to take the blood pressure of these patients, check their urine, check how the baby was growing, check how much they have weighed. Since many times with preeclampsia, some of these women may gain 25 to 40 pounds in one week. You know, something is wrong when that happens. Uh, they're accumulating water, for example. Dr. R R R Rittmeyer's Nobe Bugle project, my name, a Manchichi program is based on Fararob's Excel midwife program successfully implemented in eight rural Mayan communities in Guatemala. She came and spoke to us about it. I think I just saw her last Saturday also. And this is one that I think will work very well in, the, in La Comarca. So it is necessary then to improve women's health worldwide. As I mentioned before, this is happening all over the world, not only in Chiriquí, not only in Panama. Imperative to protect women's rights if we are to achieve this goal. About 222 million women who would like to use contraceptives are either denied the right to use them or have no access to them at all. This is especially true, for example, in women coming from La Comarca. We ask them, a, well, this is your fixed six pregnancy. Would you like us to tie your tubes? I have shared well, I have to wake, ask my husband. And then the husband say, no, absolutely not. Let's say, a, and that's it. She puts up with it. Usually they don't a, counter what he wants. Or somebody in the comarca tell them, no, if you tell your tube, this and this is going to happen. So they need to be educated. And uh, then, uh, or many times the contraceptives are simply not available there to them. They don't have birth control pills, they don't have IUDs, uh, and they have a very difficult time convincing their husbands to use preservatives. I have a, a patient up to this morning, I saw one of them, they have one of a, let's say the test for syphilis is positive, I'm going to treat you, what not, and please use a preservative if you're going to have sex until you come back uh, uh, the next time and make sure that your husband or partner is treated. Because they come back, well, he refuses to use a condom, <laughs> let's say. And that will, it. so you need to educate them or somehow if we get to them or get the comadronas, they will listen more to them than to one of us. Family planning, 
I was director of family planning for the state of Connecticut for about five years. It's based on respect for human rights, a need for women's empowerment, respect for social equality, and respect for social justice. About 16 million girls between the ages of 15 and 19 years deliver babies every year. And an unacceptable number of girls between the ages of 10 and 14 get pregnant every year. We see this at Ovaldia quite frequently. And of course, when I first came, because in New York, you have to notify the state when you see these young ladies pregnant. If you don't, you can lose your license. So I came here and I would call Asesoria Legal. Okay, finally they told me, don't call us. Call social work. <laughs> <laughs> they told me not to call them when I saw a 10 or 11 year old pregnant. And, and that's the state where we are right now. Numerous studies have shown that women who plan their families enjoy better health, have access to better education, are more likely to be empowered in their homes and communities, and are economically more productive. To ignore these unmet needs, is to accept the unacceptable. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, Dr. Osborne, that was an excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I had was, in the, in the Comarca, since a lot of the uh, deliveries are done in the Comarca, um, at home, or I guess I guess sometimes in these clinics, these uh, Puesta de Saludes within the Comarca. How how good is the data that they're getting out of there in terms of are there cases where there are uh, mortalities and injuries going on that that you think are not reported? Uh, how? Yeah, in terms of how how well is the reporting? from within inside the Comarca on mortalities that may be occurring from deliveries or post-delivery mortalities. Yes, well, uh, well the studies I did at the Comarca when I was Rotary primarily had to do more with uh, education of high school students. We had built two dormitories because some of them walked three hours in each direction to go to school. Uh, but since then, since I started at Ovaldi, I haven't been too much involved. So the numbers that I actually can't know other than what we studied in 2014. And I think it's time we start another study. To my impression, it ha things haven't changed too much. I don't know if the director of Rotary could have more data or details on this. Mm -hmm. I've done a little research to see if I could figure out how many people how many mothers actually die every year in the Comarca. And I came up with 300 maternal deaths yeah. in the Comarca. Uh, I also looked at how many babies died mm -hmm. in the Comarca, and I came up with a number of 8,000. Yeah. Uh, this was just based on various web articles that I could find. Does that sound reasonable? To yeah, you? That, that's about the numbers we came up when we looked at the charts from a uh, two years uh, in 2014. Uh, uh, there were about, as I mentioned, it was one in 736, and we had 9,000 deliveries a year. So you can multiply to find out a, a the, the number of, of maternal deaths was quite high. Okay. Well, as um, most of us here are members of the Rotary Club, and we are initiating or have initiated this major project called the Manchichi Project. Um, I, I believe, uh, Jeff, that we are going to uh, have a presence in about one third of the Comarca. Is that correct? A territory encompassing about one third of the residents of the Comarca? Be less than that. Um, we're talking about uh, six communities across three districts in the uh, Comarca. The, the the actual uh, assessment phase of it covered uh, communities within four districts, but oh. 
Oh, closer to my mouth. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but um, but but the, the the logistical reality of trying to do this across that broad of an area with the staff that that we're able to uh, afford to cover with this project is is only going to allow us probably to do six of those uh, ten communities that were assessed because of the demand that these women are going to okay. have to actually be making weekly visits uh, with the, with the uh, comadronas uh, to visit their patients. So we had to, you know, and at, at the end of the day, we're going to have to come up with some, uh, and I think we have some better logistical. So yes, yeah, six communities within the, uh, within the comarca is not going to be, this is considered a pilot study, uh, a pilot project rather within the uh, comarca. So there's going to be a lot of room for expansion and okay. growth. Okay. Oh. Uh, but for the present, um, would we be training midwives in like one tenth of the Comarca? Do you think, or a, a, a third? Not as high as a third. Right. Um, so w w my bottom line that I'm trying that to get prob probably so. I think I think maybe uh, ten ten percent would be a would be a closer number, and that's just based on. Uh, kind of an estimate of, and, and you know, we don't have a great number on how many, we don't have a great number on how many midwives are actually within the Comarca. Minsa has a number that they provided us a list and we found out that a lot of people on the list were not even midwives. So we're, we're, oh we're kind of guesstimating on that, but based on the number that we could actually confirm are midwives in these community areas uh, so far. Yeah, I, I think we're somewhere around the 10% number. How, how many midwives do we have currently? 19. 19, okay. Well, if there's 300 maternal deaths in the entire Camarca, how many of those do you think we can prevent with our initial outreach. I, I know eventually we'd like to cover the whole Comarca. We'd like to expand this, but with our initial um, program, um, it, it sounds like maybe a, f a couple of dozen lives could be saved, something in that order? Well, yes, uh, you know, certainly so, and, and components of the project, too, are going to be uh, very edu much on an educational level for the community yeah. and so in the long run it'll it'll have a, a lasting uh, good effects right and as dr uh, osborne mentioned for every one, one woman that dies there's 20 more that that are affected uh as well you yeah know? so o okay and then uh when it comes to um child mortality i mean uh, babies dying we got eight thousand babies dying um, that is a, is a shocking number, and our program will reduce the number of babies that die, correct? And not just mothers, but, but babies, because if the mothers get the, 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 um, the screening that they need um, and the treatment that they need, that will greatly reduce the infant mortality, yes. cor correct? Yes, I'm not too surprised because uh, some of the uh, women in the Comarca that come to Ovaldia are very malnourished, almost quasher core. Uh, that's especially the, the, after it has passed several months since they got some money from picking in uh, coffee or whatever, uh, they start feeding coffee beans to their babies. <laughs> That's a, and it's starvation, really. Uh, you see the hair of some of them changing to that reddish color that you will see in Quasher, which I didn't realize until I came back from the United States that you actually have starvation in the in the Comarca. So, I, and if the mothers have died or if the mothers are malnourished, uh, think what is happening to this baby that is growing. As I mentioned before. A maternal death is associated with a high number of babies or of, uh, uh, infant mortality in the first year of life because many times they don't have wealth to care for them. They, they live with a partner or husband and he's gone to work and probably they leave the babies all by themselves. So all of those things need to be addressed also. But, mm -hmm. 
work. My, my name is Tim Zelmer. I'm, I'm a retired dentist, a prosthetic surgeon. I worked for years on indigenous reservations uh, for the tribal government and as well as for the Surgeon General's office. I've got an easy question and then a bigger discussion. So the easy question is a doctor question about the issue of hypertension. It seems to be much more common in the families to be discussing issues of hypertension. Is it a higher risk situation? I notice that it's the second most common cause of death. Is it more common in the population we have here in Panama? Yeah. Or, and is that why they talk about it more in, in common conversations, that someone's having a blood pressure attack, and they make a much bigger deal about that? That's my question one. Yeah, my impression is yes. When I, uh, what uh, got my attention when I started doing ultrasound, for example, in Ovaldia, a week didn't go by that I didn't see two or three malformed babies, let's say. Of course, we have only the denominator. We don't have the denominator because so many of them deliver at home. I don't know how many deliver in, in Bocas. I don't know how many deliver inside. And you would have to have all those numbers to say definitely. But I never saw, for example, a, so many malformed babies or a, a Problem, let's say, uh, polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios is another one that leads to complications, as I saw here. But I am only seeing referrals to the only hospital coming from all over. Uh, but my impression is uh, malformations and deaths, uh, well, are higher. I, I, I pretty much can say that, yes, when you compare it with World Health Organization or with the USA. So you see it as a real yeah. concern here mm -hmm. of, of, of heightened awareness here. Yeah. yeah, for, for uh, Well, one of the things, when they came from the University of Michigan and I showed them the malformations, they wanted to do a study of it. Yeah. Because a lot of them came, let's say, from Cerro Punta. Are you referring yes, to the yes. psychop psychoptism conversation we had years ago yeah. as well? And, and then I also came from the Comarca, but I say it's one of three things, a marriage or children from people who are closely related, cousins, aunts, and so forth. Yeah. Malnutrition is the other one, and the other one is exposure to pesticides. But one of the problems they had when we look especially at the pediatrician's chart, we couldn't tell where that baby came from. They either didn't put it in the chart where they're supposed to, and we wanted to make a map of where these patients came from. So now they started putting in, but by then our relationship with Michigan, I think, didn't go through. But it's still a study that needs to be done. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the, the, the other issue to, uh, for discussion, and, and a, kind of an issue of update, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, the three major projects underneath the, the confederated uh, Christian churches inside the Comarca, the 136 churches. Those three major projects are, uh, one is ongoing, the, the radio station, the AM radio station, Radio La Paz, is now at 30%, 3,000 uh, kilowatts, and it'll have the five mentorships of training. The second and the third have uh, been conjoined, and that's the Bucket Ministries has now made uh, an upgrade decision for $3 million to do the survey, the Comarca-wide home survey, to find out how many people uh, are having diarrhea, a, a primary indication of parasites, and to provide each and every home with a water filter, parasite treatment, a New Testament in Nobe, and for each of the churches, someone to be trained to do the local survey using a solar-powered tablet. The interesting that thing that just occurred this month is Pastor Evan Redman is working with this major project, Foundations for Farming. It's a, it's a Christian-based organic uh, method that just requires a, a hoe and making your own compost, and it's a Christian-based uh, story to educate. 
that area is going to be uh, the demonstration and training center is here. We work with the Echo Seeds, which is the data-driven aspect of the seed bank, and then Hope Seeds will be the distribution. Interestingly enough, uh, Redmond, he's, he's a, a civil engineer with uh, international project management masters. He convinced them to work together so that it'll be a data-driven project combining the use of the survey of the individuals going home to home to find out where are they getting their food, what are they growing, and to use the data that's inside from the 1960s soil survey that Echo Seeds has inside their data-driven area. And I, my question for the group here, because, you know, Tom and I have spoke many times about what is the bang for our buck? How much leverage for good and saving people we can do? Would there be a way to somehow coordinate uh, these two data-driven uh, activities with the same individual who's going to be paid which is a radical idea, and also with Cristobal Fondora Citon's training of all 350 uh, Bogodai, the police for out throughout the whole Comarca as first responders. I think we're we're at a point historically that you know food, water quality, chronic malnutrition through parasites, and the activity for the Manchichi that somehow. I just present the idea and the knowledge of what's going on that I think Rotary Club of Boquete is unusually well placed in our improved relationships with the, the leadership in the Comarca and in Panama City with Parliament. Um, I think we may actually be um, looking at financial support for Chris and I to go to Zimbabwe to become trained as trainers of trainers. But my, my question for you, uh, Dr. Osborne, is how do you see us working together? Chris and I are going to be deeply involved with the Bogodai, the, the, the indigenous police force training, and now with this combined water, parasite treatment, and farming initiative. Yep. How do we bring us together to magnify what your goals are? How, how do we work together better? Well, I would say consult. You can call either a high-risk clinic. At the, I can speak with them so that you can consult them anytime. You mentioned something that quite interesting that I also see here that I didn't see in the United States. The impressive amount of parasites you get in some of these pregnant women. Ascaris, for example, they cough, come through their mouth because it has a we have seen it. And we just published an article in a European journal about the number of snake bites in pregnant women that we have seen, 51. We had the highest number of any public article, so they invited us just before the COVID problem to Paris and to London and to University of Padua to talk about it, and we had to cancel because of the COVID thing, but a 51 women we saw with snake bites that either lose their babies or a placental abruption, or mother, we, if we saw them within the first hour of the snake bite, all of them survived. Hey, but yes, cases that you usually don't see in the US or in developed countries that we do, see. Do you here. see there being an opportunity to add an additional survey uh, in the home surveys that, that are going yeah. to be starting happening mm -hmm. for medical and, and of course the Manchichi to augment our relationship, bringing dissimilar groups together as Rotarians? Yes, uh, or uh, come to one of the meetings that we have with surgeons and anesthetists and nurses and everything okay. and give a presentation yeah. there in Obaldia. We can arrange that. I'm wondering if there might be a possibility to work with Julio, the president of the Confederated Churches, who is the head of the council, working with Redmond, and these two now conjoined ones to bring it together with an additional yeah. survey in, in the software so that it's a more data-driven yes. uh, 
assistance for a greater area. Uh, that's Tom's concern and my too, that it's a small percentage of the comarca. Yeah, I'm sure that if you present it there and they see that it has a good chance of success, they will try to join. Everybody wants to be associated with a project that is successful. <laughs> right now there have been a few presented and it's going to go and we're going to test for protein and we're going to test for glucose and we're going to test for blood in the urine, which they don't do regularly here because they, everything that you get has to come from the Ministry of Health in Panama. We cannot buy anything independently through here. And they run out. At times we have to get out of our pockets to pay for surgical sutures, for example, <laughs> because it take, took too long to wait from Panama to order it. And uh, if they see a project like this, and all these things are being done or can be done, I'm pretty sure they will try to join. Yeah, we. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the survey, the point in time where we're initiating a survey mm -hmm. and now have a new software written to gather the, that data for both projects. Mm -hmm was very exciting and hearing you speak mm -hmm. it's a compelling story of need of, of tremendous you know compassion mm -hmm. uh, humanitarian need i just yeah. don't know what we could develop as as a partnership there but that's a, that's an yeah. ongoing question i, I just wanted to raise uh dr zellner i think there's probably a discussion that should be taken to a round table or private discussion and maybe we could open it up to any other questions for Dr. Osborne. Um, I would like to say that in August, I'm going to have Jeff Flynn from Rotary come and tell you about the Manchichi project, the midwife project. And that's very exciting. And do you know the exact date in August, Jeff? 19th of August, Thursday. So watch the emails going out, the ads, and please come and, and learn about that because the way I understand it, it was an outgrowth of something that Dr. Osborne started and started thinking about many years ago. And this is the practical solution to the problem that he saw. Mm -hmm. So any other questions? Yes. Uh, oh. Oh, Go ahead, Ron. yeah, so 8,000 fetal deaths or infant deaths is extremely high. Can you give us an idea or do you know what sort of factors are there? You know, is it they're delivering premature, uh, they're getting septic, why are so many children, why are so many babies die? Yeah, I would say because of poor, poor access to medications, for example. Well, and to test even. One of the problems that I have had is, for example, you order the regular laboratories that you order in prenatal care. You order her to have an ultrasound, and you order her to get prenatal vitamins. If they are not right there in the clinic, and they come back the next time and ask for the result, well, I didn't have money to buy it. I have none the test. I have none the ultrasound. And, and they, if it is a money to buy for a meal for the home or to buy for a medication, guess what they're going to do? The meal. Right. And, and they just, every time I order a test for them, they ask, well, do I have to pay for that? Almost uniformly, <laughs> and so forth. And I think that is the problem, that you either advise them or even write them a prescription or suggest something to them, and you don't think that, a hey, for them, one dollar is a lot. So they just simply don't do it. Mm -hmm. Are these, uh, do you think uh, many of these deaths are a result of the actual delivery? Mm -hmm. that, that there are complications during delivery and the baby dies during the delivery? Yeah, well, many times they, those babies, when you do an ultrasound before they are born, you can tell that they have what we call centralization. For example, if you take the a blood pressure of the fetus with the ultrasound, it should be higher in the cord, it should be higher in the peripheral, and the brain itself it should be very low. When you start getting anoxic episodes, you see that it switches. The blood is shifted to the brain, so that, that baby is getting anoxic even at times weeks before it's born. So I'm not surprised that even if it's born and it appears to be normal, 
most likely it will succumb to any little infection or any other stress that you will put on it. Thank you.